Hello, my name is Paul Benishai. I am a, a doctor in physics and a senior lecturer in Ariel University in Israel. Um, I've spent the last 20 years of my life uh, investigating the interaction of radio waves and all frequencies with matter. And matter includes tissues and tissues includes people. So I have spent a lot of my time looking at how radio waves interact with people. So I'm going to give you a lecture today on mobile phone radiation and pose the question to you, is it safe or is it not? Um, I'm also not going to give you the answer, but we'll see about that when we come to the end. So I'll start my lecture um, with this slide. Um, very recently, in fact, only a month ago in the journal of the American Medical Association Oncology, uh, there appeared this article, Radio Frequency Radiation and Cancer, a review. Um, the article uh, basically says that there is no reasons for concern. There is no evidence to support that radio waves from mobile phones and their infrastructure can cause cancer. Uh, in fact, it basically states that everything is wonderfully safe and we should not worry. Um, now, I've started with this because this, if you like, is an industry view, uh, but it is deeply, deeply flawed uh, to the point where um, it is, in fact, a little deceptive. So what I want to do in this lecture is actually go over some of the evidence that we do have that shows that there is some reason to be concerned and that, in fact, there is some form of interaction um, between us and radio waves, which is detrimental to our health. So um, let's start. So biological interactions with EMF. EMF stands for electromagnetic uh, frequencies, uh, basically radio waves. Well, first of all, they are non-ionizing. And what do we mean by uh, non-ionizing? We mean they cannot break apart molecules. OK, so what are we talking about here when we say radio waves? Well, we'll talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, and, and this is what you see before you hear. Um, uh, basically, uh, it, it's an electric field that oscillates, and that's what, that, that's what it means by electromagnetic spectrum. And the oscillations can be very, very slow. You can see all the way down over to here, if I just highlight. So just let me get my, my, my laser pointer. All the way down over here, we're talking about one oscillation per second. That's almost like a direct current. Um, up to hundreds of oscillations per second, which is really what our electricity grids work on or what computers will work on, for instance. And as we come up to the kilohertz, we come to the, what is usually known as the radio spectrum itself, where our TV broadcasts are, where ra radio happens, and where in particular mobile phones happen, uh, microwaves, can also work. And if we continue on up, we even get to the visible spectrum where we actually see. Um, so we are actually concerned with what's going on in this area around about the hundreds of megahertz to the uh, to the 510 uh, gigahertz. Now, one gigahertz is, is one oscillation every thousand billionth of a second to give you an idea of how fast these, the, this field will change. So what do we know about this in terms of biology? How does it interact with biology? That's, that's our next question. Well, um, if we look at the traditional view, the radio frequencies that are associated with, with uh, mobile phones are, have two characteristics. One, they are non-ionizing. Two, if they're strong enough, they can cause thermal damage. Uh, when we say non-ionizing, what we actually mean is that, um, and I borrowed this image from the, uh, the article that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association. We mean that basically when a small packet of, of radio waves, yeah, a photon, uh, hits a molecule, in this case, a molecule of DNA, it has enough power inside it that it can eject uh, an electron. And that's called ionization. Um, by causing part of that atom to, to or that molecule to, to break apart, if you like, it can therefore cause damage. And that's called ionizing. Now, the amount of energy inside the uh, radio waves associated with mobile phones cannot do that. And of this, there is no, no discussion. The other aspect is thermal damage. Well, basically, 
uh, electromagnetic radiation and radio waves in particular uh, are, get absorbed by materials. And, and you have in front of you here a graph, a very famous graph, I have to tell, at least in my field, done by a man called Herbert Schwann all the way back in the early 50s, which shows at what frequencies uh, do biological tissues absorb uh, radio waves. And in fact, that the um, radio waves we're talking about are up here. And that little peak that you see there refers to the absorption by water. So if you put energy into anything, it's got to come out somehow. And it comes out usually in terms of heat. That's how your microwave oven actually works, which actually works around about here. Um, so basically, if you do anything enough power, then you're going to cause heat damage, which can also disturb and destroy tissues. Now, I state immediately here that the amount of energy in the transmissions of our cell phones is not great enough to cause thermal damage. However, and it is a big however, there's plenty of evidence showing that something else is happening, that there is some interaction going on that is causing damage to us, or health damage, if you like, uh, which is not ionizing for sure, and is not linked to thermal damage, i.e. the waves are not strong enough to cause thermal damage. And I've just taken a few um, articles um, that I know of, which show in meta-analysis that there is a link between the risk of tumors developing and, therm and mobile phone use, that there are uh, risks of brain tumors, uh, and that there is other types of um, damage are happening when we are exposed to long-term exposure at the radio waves, even at the low intensities that we have in our phones, low enough so that they won't cause us thermal damage. Um, now, the scientific literature is, is full of such studies. In fact, on one database, there's over 4,000 of such studies that we've been able to see, um, stretching over, as you can see from here, uh, from 2009, 2013, all the way up until uh, today, in fact, correlation between radiation before 5G uh, antennas were, were put down um, and epidemiological indicators of various uh, ill health that can be. This is from uh, Valentas in Madrid. So there's something happening here and we have to ask ourselves what it is. So let, let's start, first of all, by understanding some of the terms that you're gonna hear when uh, we talk about cell phone radiation. And the first one is how do we define what's called dosimetry? Basically, how today do we uh, talk about how much energy you absorbed from your cell phone? Well, you're gonna hear of a particular measure called SAR. SAR stands for specific absorption rate. And it's a quantitative measure, if you like, of how much energy from the radio wave you will be absorbed in the human body. And it can be linked, I mean, if I just explain some of these little terms here, it can actually be linked to the change in temperature. If you see a big capital T, that means temperature. If you see a small t, it's going to mean time. So it can be, it can be linked to the, uh, um, the rate of heating that you would get in a tissue. Um, now, it is a measure of what we call a plane wave power density. Uh, meaning it is a very particular type of wave, but not actually a type of wave that really comes out from the cell phone. It is uh, the, the most basic type of wave that you can imagine. Now, um, I won't explain too much in detail what these terms mean. Uh, the other uh, terminology that you're going to hear is called power density. Now, this is what's usually used when we talk about the ambient radiation, the radiation from distant cell phone towers rather than the radiation that's coming off your phone. And this is a measure of how much energy content there is because of a transmission from far field, from far away. Okay, and that's called the power density. Now, as far as the industry is concerned, everything is fine. Uh, this article was published in 2015 in the trade journal uh, Microwave Magazine um, of the IEEE. And it basically uh, tells us that there's not really too much to worry about. And these are the current international standards of how much radiation you can be exposed to in terms of power density, i.e. in the general ambient sense. And they stand at the moment uh, for the um, 
uh, FCC at one milliwatt per square centimeter, which doesn't sound too much. Um, for the grouping ICNIP, which is the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, uh, which is an international group, um, basically aligned with uh, the needs of industry rather than the needs of public health, who, at least ostensibly, uh, intends to collect all the available scientific information, discuss it, and issue guidelines accordingly. And they, they, they are the people who uh, advise the WHO. Um, you can see that some countries have lower standards. In fact, Russia has a very low standard of 0.1, or sorry, 0 0.01 milliwatt per square centimeter, one hundredth of what is allowed in the United States. Um, Switzerland, Italy, the same, but in particular areas. And what you have written down there is, is honest, that's the typical minimum exposure, maximum exposure from a cell, cellular base station mounted on a tower. Here you go. With a quite high radiating power. Um, nothing's wrong here. Uh, but somehow, as you've seen from the, the information that I showed you earlier, the, the, the articles that are coming out in the, in, in the scientific literature, there's a problem happening here. And it doesn't really seem to be quite so safe for generations to come as they uh, they, they say. Now, these standards, and it has to be stated, they're designed principally for one thing and one thing only. They are designed for thermal hazards, that it shouldn't heat you. Therefore, you can be exposed, according to their standards, when you make a cell phone call, uh, for a maximum of six minutes, according to the standard. Um, and if we look at them, what they tell us, uh, the ICNIP standard and the FCC are very similar, if not the same. Uh, this is what they tell us. Now, what I didn't write down here is that these standards are for maximums of six minutes only. That's what they actually write down. I've never yet heard of people who expose themselves only for six minutes. But these standards, and these are the standards now for what you can get from your phone, are quite generous, yeah? So if you are a professional, the working threshold for humans, that's us, yeah? SAR value, the amount that your body's allowed to absorb, over your entire body, averaged, will be four watts uh, per one kilogram of your flesh. Um, the FCC uh, restricts that uh, for people who have to work with radiation, people who go up in the towers, for instance, to 0.4 watts per kilogram, they, they take a, 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 ten, a one tenth safety margin. Um, and the recommendation for people who are just the general public is 1.6 watts per kilogram averaged over one gram of your tissue in your head um, or four watts per kilogram for 10 grams of tissues in your limbs, like your hand. Uh, meaning basically, okay, that you know, if you're using your phone, uh, that's how much energy you could put out that you can absorb and still not have thermal damage of any significant amount, at least according to them. So uh, let's look a little bit more at these, these, these standards. Uh, this is basically what they tell you and in what frequency ranges that can happen. So this is what it is. It can actually says even more to two watts per kilogram they're allowed. And that's actually what you'll find in Europe. Now, are they really relevant? Uh, that's the big question. Well, if you start looking at the same standards in terms of frequencies, you can see how they actually change and go up. Now, your cell phones are actually working here. And here you're allowed a higher standard. You're allowed rather a lower standard. You can absorb more information, which is rather strange because just about here is the peak absorption um, of water and we're 70% water. So you would imagine, because there we will absorb energy much better, that for cell phones, we would actually be absorbing far, far less. And in fact, they allow us to absorb far, far more. So let's talk about the history of these standards. Where do they come from? Well, they start way, way back in the depths of the Cold War in the 1950s. Uh, there'd been an explosion in the use of radar uh, because of the threat between the Western and, and the Soviet bloc. Uh, but the military was beginning to notice that many of its operators in the, of these radar stations were developing detrimental health effects. These could be cataracts, they could even be cancers, skin lesions, uh, headaches, and, and a lack of sleep. So it was decided that maybe this is an issue that had to be looked at um, to understand uh, what powers were this happening and, was, and, and, and what would be a safe level. 
So they started uh, and they pulled together what was called the Tri-Services Conference, which unified the efforts made by the uh, US Army, Navy and the Air Force, as well as industry groupings like Mayo Clinic, uh, General Electric and Bell Labs. Of course, we're gonna supply them with a lot of the technology that they needed. So in about 1959, they came along with the first idea of what would be considered a safe standard. And the standard they chose was one milliwatt per square centimeter. In fact, the exact same standard that you have today for your cell phones. Um, now, how did they get there? It was, a, it was a little macabre, and certainly it was research that you would never be allowed to do today. For instance, they took dogs, live dogs, and measured the time it would take to cook their testes. Um, and here it is, if, if they expose them at 10 milliwatts per square centimeter for 30 minutes, they would basically render the dog sterile. Or they did the same with a dog at 100 milliwatts per square centimeters for one hour and killed it. Um, they did tests also on animals to see if body mass, um, monkeys to see if body mass would actually make a difference. At the end of the day, the measure they finally came to was more or less arbitrary. It seemed to be safe, although they couldn't say why. And in fact, you can see on the graph down below the timeline, 1953 to 1960, just where they came to this conclusion that around about 1959, it should be round about uh, one uh, milliwatt per square centimeter. Well, um, this other graph shows the, the, the sort of information that they had gathered to, to get here. And you can see along the, on the, the x-axis, yeah, time in seconds, and the y-axis, the power density. So they were actually measuring according to what power density, what damage you could do. And for the dog, you can see the poor dog's testes being cooked there after more or less half an hour at low power, almost instantaneous if it was higher power. And what would happen to human being, or the eye in particular, if you exposed it to high powers for even short periods of time. The research between 1959 until about 1966, whatever research was done in academia, was done basically to confirm that this indeed was a safe, a safe level to work. And the underlying principle to all this is that the only damage, the only problem would be via heating. So about 1966, this standard uh, becomes more accessible in the US when it is taken over by the Association of Standards of, uh, or the American Standards Association, ASA, and it is, gets a, 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 a name and it's called C95.1. Um, and that really goes forward until all the way up until 1996 when the FCC virtually adopts it after being taken also by the, uh, the IEEE and that becomes a standard. So these standards really they're not from 1996, they're not from 2000, they're not from 2020, they're actually all the way back to about 1959. Um, how, so how, how do you, you know, decide it's safe? So after 1966, a lot of work was done to see if this really was safe. And, and the way they did that was by, by uh, looking at animal behavior. They had noticed that, you know, animals, if exposed to microwave radiation for any amount of time, would, would change the way they acted. They, they, they seem to be lethargic. They seem not to want to eat. They seem not to be able to perform. And so they, they made a set of, once again, uh, experiments which would, would ethically not be allowed today, by which they took animals. They measured their core body temperature. Um, they did that with uh, rectal probing. Um, they exposed them and saw whenever the, the behavior would change and, and if the behavior would resort when they turned off the, uh, the microwaves. And that really is the basis for saying the, the standard is safe. And that's about as far as it really goes. So, as I said, 2001, sorry, 2001, the, the 1996 um, recommendation finally became uh, an actual uh, regulation. And as I said, it's all about heating. So now that you know where this, these, these ratings come from, um, is the size a rating? Is it, is it really that safe? Um, here it is again. Um, and you can see the, the way they, we now know how they got them. There was the, 
the levels of exposure which bad things seem to happen by heating and they took a number of safety levels and, and it down it comes to what is considered to be safe well you have to ask the question is the threshold limit realistic does the cellular industry keep to it we can answer that one later and we could also say ask ourselves how will 5g change all this if it changes this but anyway coming back to it um there were so many questions being asked specifically about okay longer term effects that the fda nominated the ntp the national toxicology program as the body best suited to make a long-term animal study to test what's called the null hypothesis the null hypothesis is very simple if you state that cell phone radiation is safe and cannot cause cancers or anything like this let me do a study to see if it can if it can cause a cancer then i've basically nulled your hypothesis and that's basically what they did mm -hmm. this study cost 30 million dollars um it was well thought out well done approved by the fda and its stat and, and its, its findings were, were published in 2018 and 2019 and they were a mini earthquake because what they had discovered is that yes cell phone radiation at the levels experience uh, that, that are acceptable for g uh, for gsm or, or second generation and third generation third generation phones sorry and uh, fourth generation phones can and does cause cancer. At least that's what they were able to find in the animal studies they've done on rats. They found some quite horrible things, in fact. They discovered that after peer review, um, that they were able to cause cancers in rats and in mice, and there were lesions. These were along the lines of endocardial schwannomas. Um, my myocardial schwannomas a different sort of sort uh, of of tumor uh, endocardial schwann cell hyperplasmia now i'm a physicist not a physician okay so for me as i imagine for you all this really means is that they could find cancer and it was caused by the cell phone radiation cardiomyopathies of all sorts problems in the hearts and there are plenty of others as well including what's called genotoxicology i.e dna damage of some form so there seems to be a bit of a problem with this whole idea of the SAR rating. So where could that problem come from? If it is just only heat? Well, how do you actually establish that a phone has a SAR rating? You are gonna be a little bit surprised. What you do is this, you take a, a robotic arm and on the end of that robotic arm is a probe, which can measure the field strength. And you put your phone under a bath filled with a gel which is supposed to simulate the same properties, electromagnetic properties um, of your flesh. You turn the phone on, uh, but you make sure that it, it, it is constantly transmitting in what's called continuous wave, not the way it actually works. And you measure, and you measure inside this gel bath. Uh, and that's basically how it looks. Now there's a number of problems with all this, if you think about it. Uh, first of all, we are not, bags of, of gel. Uh, we are very heterogeneous. Um, our tissues are not all the same. Uh, we have bones, we have skin, we have all sorts of stuff inside us. They don't all act the same way to uh, electromagnetic waves. They don't all absorb in the same way. So that's already a particular problem. And if we look at this, uh, this is a breakdown of the human skull in terms of what it's made of, uh, fat air, air inside, mucous membranes, nerves, muscle, brain, glands, blood vessels. It certainly looks nothing like a large bath of, of saline gel. Um, and if I actually now put this, this may not mean a lot to people, but it means an awful lot to me because these are all the different properties that you need to know about for all of those particular uh, internal parts of us, blood, bone, brain, whatever, skin, um, in order to understand how it will act when you hit it with a radio uh, with a radio wave. Okay, now you can see, I'm not gonna try and explain what the num the, what the, uh, the symbols mean, but you can see the numbers are very different for all the different parts of our body. We are not a big bag of saline. So when you do simulations, you see like this. Now, these are simulations done in Spain. 
and basically you can see that the SAR values, the so-called uh, safe levels absorbed, now they've done the simulation by having in a, a phone or source um, just outside the human skull that they've simulated, the values they're getting are far, far higher, much, much higher than what they should be. And the temperature variations can also be very much higher. So there's a problem fixing the rating of what your phone can put out according to a large bath of saline gel, yeah? And not considering what it is when you look at a real life human body. So how does that actually translate? I mean, here you see some pictures. These are now 3D models. We can do this, we've got computers. Computers can do amazing things. So we can, we can actually simulate a model of the, the, almost the whole human body. Uh, in terms of how it would behave. And this is you know, quite a shocking thing to see if you like. You, you've got here um, two images. Uh, so basically the idea is that you'd have uh, against these heads, a cell phone, and the cell phone will be transmitting it up to about two watts. This was done in the days of second generation when you could actually do that. Um, and you would see at different frequencies, very different distributions of where that energy will be deposited inside the body and how much would actually be deposited inside the body. So the way we are actually establishing whether our phones are safe is, is clearly wrong. It's just not correct. There's one other point um, we didn't mention before when we are talking about how they fix the SAR rating for these devices. Yeah, they use this large bath of saline. That large bath of saline was based on the dimensions of an adult male. In fact, an adult male in the US military to be precise. But what about kids? Kids are much smaller, okay? And being much smaller, we do know because we have the, 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 the research that the radio wave can penetrate much deeper. We do know that they can absorb much better. We also know that the child's brain is only just developing. What does that mean? Is there gonna be an effect? Well, difficult to say, but I'll tell you what we do know. When we've looked at animal studies, we do see effects on the juveniles from radio frequency radiation, that we do affect their attention, their, their attention spans. We do affect how the brain wires itself. So what does that mean for our children? Nowadays, you can make whole body models. Now these body models are bodies inside a computer and they are accurate down to one millimeter level. And you can use those to actually simulate what happens. But even if you're doing this, you're still coming to the same point. The assumption is that the only real problem is heating. But it's not. We're way, way, way beyond heating. So what other mechanisms could we have that would actually cause us to get sick from a phone if we're not heating, if the levels are low anyway? Well, there is quite a few physical methods that could be that we know about nowadays. One of the most popular and probably the easiest to, to, to think about is something called a voltage gated calcium channel. Now, I want you to imagine um, that you could see a cell in a human body. That cell would look like a balloon filled with water. And if you took that balloon and you dropped it into a swimming pool, you'd pretty much get the situation that you have with a cell in our body. It is, in fact, a sac full of water with a membrane, yeah? And it exists in an environment which has got lots of other water around it. And in fact, if you really wanted to think about tissues, the best way to think about a, a, how a tissue would look is if you filled that swimming pool and you just dropped more and more water-filled balloons inside that swimming pool until you could fill no more. You would still have the balloons contacting one to the other, but around them would also be water. And that's pretty much a good analogy of what goes on. Now, inside those balloons, inside our cells, there is a complex biological machinery made of proteins, made of DNA, made of the cellular nucleus, made of mitochondrial elements, all sorts of stuff doing the job of keeping the cell alive and making the cell perform what it has to perform. Now, the cells have to, in some ways, if you like, communicate with each other. 
basically what it means is that the those membranes, yeah, those plastic balloons, they are not impervious. They can open and close little holes in them in the membrane to allow the passage of ions like calcium, like sodium, in and out to regulate processes inside the cell itself. And one of the main processes they do have to regulate is what's called uh, free radicals, uh, reactive oxygen uh, uh, species. Because as a living being, the, 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 the cell is living, yeah, it is consuming energy. And as a natural part of its metabolic process, it actually has, it causes uh, molecules which actually can be quite damaging. Um, in particular, free radicals like OH minus, like uh, O2 minus, yeah, hydrogen peroxide. And these, can, these, these chemicals can actually damage the interior of the cell. They can cause reactions with DNA and break apart DNA. We've had millions of years to evolve mechanisms by which we can regulate the activity of, of uh, reactive oxygen species and even stop them happening in certain, certain ways. And they do that, and the cells can do that by simply opening the membrane and allowing um, ions to come in, calcium ions and sodium ions, which can neutralize, to hold everything in check, to keep everything in what's called homeostasis, i.e. in the most optimal operating condition, if you like. Now, here's the point. To do that, there are special proteins in these membranes, which can open and close, and they're gates. And they open and close according to the difference in concentrations of ions on one side of the membrane, up here, compared to the other side of the membrane, down here. When that changes, these proteins go through what's called a conformational change, and this channel can open up, and ions can flow in, and ions can flow out. Well, they actually have a characteristic time to do this. Yeah? They need a certain amount of time to do it. And the time to do it is about 50 milliseconds. Now, a change in concentration of ions from here to here to someone like me is like saying that I have a different electrical charge here than I have here. Different electrical charges to physicists means electrical fields. So basically, these things work by making a different electrical field over them. And that's why they're called voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, the time scale for work is about 15 milli uh, milliseconds. Unfortunately for us, the time scale of cellular communications is pretty much the same, four milliseconds. So what that means is that these channels, which act by having a different electric field over them, are being exposed to uh, mobile phone signals, which themselves are pulsed, and are pulsed at pretty much the same time frame as the, the operative time frame for these things to open. Now, a signal is an electric field, and it's changing up and down. So if this electric field comes over here, what happens is this gate doesn't work as it should work. It works badly. Over time, over long time, the effects of these gates not working well, of the interior of our cells not being properly regulated, leads to some forms of disease and can even lead in its most ultimate form to cancer. Now this effect is nothing to do with heating and it's nothing to do with ionization. Yet, unfortunately, the industry totally ignores it and refuses to accept it. So I've just given you an idea or a model of how it could happen. Do we have any evidence that it does? Well, we do. We do in laboratory studies have evidence that it does. And there's plenty of papers out there which shows that in fact, this mechanism, yeah, the voltage gated calcium channel mechanism can actually exist and does exist and is problematic. So we know that this can work. And if this can work, then there is some cause to concern about the standards that we're using today.
Okay. So we have now a lot, as you can see, I'm just constantly bringing up to you more and more uh, articles that show it. So are we evaluating exposures correctly? Well, I think we can make some conclusion. And the first conclusion is obviously that SAR values, they're probably not very relevant. And I'll be honest, I'm not the only person saying this, but it's been noted and this paper came out quite recently, very nice paper as well, I have to say, which points out that, you know, that SAR is not gonna stop these, uh, you know, electromagnetic field bio effects that we are seeing because they relate to thermal effects, which are not actually very relevant here. And in fact, this is what they wrote in their conclusions. SAR effect actually refers to a thermal effect, but the vast majority of recorded biological effects are not thermal. All right, so that's one thing we can definitely say. So we have to move clearly to full body simulations because the way they're evaluating the SAR anyway is on a big bag of saline. And we are not big bags of saline. We're very complex and we have to take that into consideration. Now, we also have to consider the fact we're moving to higher frequencies, whether we like it or not, that's where the cell phone industry is going. So is all of these, these ideas for uh, exposure evaluation that have been in the past, are they gonna be even relevant? Well, no, actually, because there's something called a skin temperature effect. Now, to explain this, I've got to take you back to the very beginning and look once again at this particular uh, slide. Now, we talked about the fact that the electromagnetic uh, field is constantly changing, yeah? Uh, we talked about the, the speed at which it changes that, you know, down here, if we look, just let me put my uh, laser pointer on, over here, the field will change uh, positive to negative uh, for once in one second, uh, but up here where the microwaves and the, the, the cell phones are working, uh, it's doing that 1000 billion times per second but it's also propagating through space. And so these changes are happening like a wave as it goes along. Um, if you think about it, take a kid, yeah, with a jump rope. The kid flicks the jump rope up and down. What you actually see is you see the flick that they made propagate along the rope until it hits to the end. You see the wave move. Same exact thing happens when we talk about electromagnetic radiation, when we're talking about radio waves. Now, it's very important uh, to understand that the distance, yeah, between here and here, this oscillation, as you see, the distance between the peak of a wave and the next peak of a wave is linked to the frequency, actually very, very uh, tightly the frequency times the wavelength, and that's what we call the wavelength, the distance between peak to peak of that oscillation as it moves down the row, is equal to the speed. And the speed of light is fixed. We know what it is. So the faster the wave will change, the faster the, the uh, oscillation will happen, the smaller the wavelength will be. Now, if you take that same kid flicking the rope and you bring in her friend who catches the other side of the rope and we she flicks it down, when it comes to the friend who's holding the rope and holding its stick, we can see that it will hit the hand and then it will ripple back. It'll be reflected. The same thing happens with radio waves when they go through tissues. When they come to a, a, a border between one type of tissue and another type of tissue, part of the wave is reflected back. Now, if you take those two kids once again, come to that jump rope and they start to flick the rope at the right time together, you'll see the wave gets big and it seems to stand. You no longer see a wave flick down the, the line. You just seem to see a wave going up and down and it seems to stand there between these two kids as they flick the wave up and down. Guess what? The exact same thing happens with radio waves. When we push a radio wave in the microwave region, which is jumping up and down in the regions of uh, 1,000 billion times per second, that wavelength is in the order of centimeters, okay? When we go to higher frequencies, it shortens down, even down towards millimeters. So when that penetrates into a tissue and it meets a boundary between two different types, part that wave is, comes back. And that then hits the other boundary on the other side and it comes back too. And eventually they do what's called constructive interference. They stand and we see a big wave seems to stay there, just like the two kids flicking the jump rope up and down, up and down. Well, that's important because that means you can absorb the energy far, far better. And about two years ago, in 2000, no, more than two years ago now, in about 2018, 
This paper came out um, by a good friend of mine, uh, which showed that theoretically, because of this uh, effect of a standing wave, even if you kept the, 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 the intensities of these, these uh, signals low, you'd begin to see some pretty big temperature fluctuations inside the skin, big temperature fluctuations mm -hmm. of levels of more than a degree. Well, it was a nice bit of theory last year, so I improved it. A pretty horrible experiment to do, it was all done by a good friend of mine, and this is published, you can find this. Um, what they he did, they took fresh cow brains, which had just been slaughtered. Um, they pumped in radio waves of the sort of frequencies uh, that you will get uh, from cell phones. They, they made them also pulsed, uh, as well as just continuous. And they put temperature probes inside these uh, cow brains at various distances to see what the temperatures would be and how the energy would be absorbed. So this is an actual factual experiment done directly. And this is what they saw. They saw these actual temperature variations as predicted beforehand. So there's another problem here as well, as we go to the higher frequencies to be used in 5G. Even if you're worried just about thermal effects, these can also become serious now. They can also have it. So it seems the SAR ratio rating that's being used is, is just not there, not good, not working. Well, my own personal research, which I, I've been done, um, I, I look at even smaller stuff. I, I look at skin itself. And here you can see an actual live image of skin and you're seeing there the surface of the skin. That's this. Yeah, and you're seeing here the dermis, the bottom of the skin where all the blood vessels are. And in between the two, this is the epidermis. And those coils that you see are actually the human sweat duct. Uh, this is done by a technique called optical coherence tomography. And anyone who's been to an eye doctor recently may have actually had this done on him to image the, uh, the cornea of the eye. Or even if you go to a skin doctor nowadays, you may actually have this done on you to, to image your skin to see what it looks like. These are the boundaries I was talking about, the dermis to the epidermis to the skin surface. So when a wave comes in, that's exactly where it can stand. So we also simulated it to see if there will be any effect there. And here's a simulation that we made, the simulation model that we made. Now, these distances are really small, yeah? They we're talking here about um, 0.3 of a millimeter. And this distance here is probably about uh, two millimeters, about the thickness of the skin on your hand. And what we discovered was when you had the presence of a sweat duct in there, which is full of basically water and has a conduction mechanism, what we found was that the uh, absorption rates were far, far higher. And this wasn't being taken into consideration. And this is a problem because it means that this skin effect was shown to happen theoretically, practically, and in simulation. But once again, that's not really being counted. So the last question I have, uh, is the cell phone industry keeping to its own rates? It's a big question. Well, there's been a number of nice applications that have come out recently for phones. This is the one that I've been using, which allows you to see just how much energy your phone is putting out and just how much energy your phone is receiving depending on where it is and depending on whether it's connected to Wi-Fi as well as to the cellular network. And uh, you can use these. And if you get a special version of it, then you can actually record all this data and see just how safe you are. Um, some examples when we've done this sort of research, this is Australia. As you can see, the values in Australia, and these are in microwatts. So that's actually close to three watts. Now this is a guy's phone, yeah? Um, and he's measuring the field that he's, he's actually getting, that he's actually the field that his phone is putting out, his personal phone is putting out as he drives along what is actually a country road coming out of Melbourne. Um, and you can see the values are three. That's three watts per square, per, per square meter. This is now coming way, way, way up and actually coming quite close to the so-called allowed standards. This is within half of the allowed standard uh, that the uh, ICNIP and that the FCC say is, is, is acceptable. Um, and you can see it happens also 
uh, in Japan, the same. And here we see very high values inside a city, Shinjuku. And actually, if we go further, this is in Buenos Aires. Once again, very, very high levels uh, from both. And, and this is also quite important because here you see different types of cell phone uh, radiation. This is from a 4G and this is from a 3G. But it doesn't seem to matter. We're still getting extremely high values. In fact, the 4G was given much higher value for some strange reason. And um, it doesn't matter who your provider is. This is in Honduras, two different providers. Uh, your providers can be very, you know, uh, problematic. This provider in 3G was giving very high levels. The phones were having to work very, very hard to, to, to work with this provider. Whereas with this provider in the same area, far, far less. So the cell phone industry is not very uh, honest about this. And this of course is, is in Israel. Um, once again, I can see that our providers the same. There's areas where we had very, very high exposure levels, in fact. Um, this is in a, home, uh, a town called Modin in Israel itself. And you can see that the phone that was being used here was putting out three watts per square meter almost all the time. Now, this is actually one third of the allowed limit, where the industry says on average it should be we should only have a problem of about one thousandth of, of the, the allowed limit, but it's not. It's far, far higher. That's what we have, and you can even see here. Here we actually broke the limit at least once or twice. Looking at the mobile emissions and the total emissions coming off a phone, so there's quite a few problems to think about here, and I think just another example. Once again, here also we broke the limits almost all the times always come up to be very high. Um, and I, I think I will stop there, my talk. There's no real conclusion here, except the fact that there's a problem. Thank you. <laughs>